Good morning and welcome to our online service from Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this 29th day of May. We are glad you are here with us. No matter where you or I find ourselves this morning, we are connected by our desire to gather in community and explore our faith through scripture, prayer, music, and reflection. A few words before we begin. If you are new to online worship with Fairlawn, I encourage you to scroll down below this link and open the music bulletin prepared by our Director of Music, Eleanor Daly. This is an integral part of our worship experience. This Sunday is referred to as Ascension Sunday, where we read one of several gospel stories that describes how the disciples experienced Jesus leaving them after his death and resurrection. There is much to ponder and wrestle with on Ascension Sunday. This service is one way out of many to understand this particular story from the early church. Can it still speak to our troubled and topsy-turvy world? Some gathering words. Like the heron, shoreline sentry, poised, posted, patient, let us wait upon God, alert and expectant. Like the osprey who hovers, then plunges, then rises, let us bring God our hunger and rise in God's grace. Like the hummingbird who sips here and gone at the feeder, let us live out our being, dance and dart at God's prompting, with the rest of creation rushing headlong towards summer, let us fill up our moments with prayer, passion and praise. For all that reminds us, that refreshes our memory, that recalls us unbidden, that ushers in your presence, the drone of the lawnmower, the scent of the cut grass, the calf and the foal nursing and nurtured, fruit blossom and lilac and peony and pansy. For words of comfort, encouragement, interest, those uttered aloud, those spoken in silence, for gesture and impulse, for the actions of others, the thoughtful, the heartfelt, the kind and the gentle, we give thanks. Let us pray. God of the story, you are in and out of the stories we read, calling us into them and calling us out of them. Give us courage to listen to our own curiosities as we read old stories. Dare us to ask the questions hidden in the heart of the text. Lead us to mine with heart and mind and desire and desperation the many meanings in the one story, because this is where we find you and where you find us. Amen. Our reader for this morning is Lori Kimmel. Listen carefully as she reads us today's gospel story. Listen as if you've never heard it before. The season of Easter extends the experience of Easter Sunday for six weeks but it also helps prepare for the coming of the mystery of Pentecost, which is next Sunday. This period is a transition between Jesus' earthly ministry and the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is a time when the disciples and others began to know Jesus in a new way. He is neither simply human nor simply spiritual. He's completely both in a way that is anything but simple. Today we hear one of the several stories of Jesus' ascension to heaven in the Gospels. None of these stories are easy. Our task is to glimpse and try and understand the stories as they were told by those first Christians 2,000 years ago. By paying attention to the nooks and crannies where the imagination can lodge, Sometimes a new story emerges, the story changes, we change, 
and we find our way into an old story. This is a work of theology. It is also a work of intelligence. And it is a work of prayer. Our reading today is from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. Then Jesus said, Do you remember what I taught you when we were together? All the important events of my life find an echo in the rules of Moses and in the things God's speakers and the songwriters said. Then Jesus explained the old books to them and said, The old books say that God's chosen will suffer and that he will come back to life after three days. They also say that his message of new life and forgiveness must be taken all over the world to every land, starting with the people of Jerusalem. You have a vital role because you've seen it all. I'm going to send you the special gift promised to you by my father. So stay here in Jerusalem until you get the confidence you need for the job. Then they walked out together to Bethany, where he lifted his hands and blessed them. As he blessed them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem, overwhelmed with joy. And they were continuously in the temple, praising God. Here ends our reading. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. I have always believed in thin places where the holy reveals itself to us, where we glimpse wonder and wisdom and awe. Lately, on my morning walks, I have been very aware my world and the world of others have been intersecting so that a story is unfolding and the holy is hovering. Nora Gallagher, a writer I greatly admire, says of these kinds of experiences, I feel completely in the present, no part of me missing. I think that has something to do with eternity. It's a mindfulness of the other that is easy to ignore in a large, busy city. So my morning walks are reconnecting me to thin places where God can be found in unexpected places and in unexpected people. The Gospels are rather like that for me. I forget sometimes that the stories can also be holy ground, a thin place where wonder and the cosmos can break in. Do you remember the words from the scripture that Laurie read to us today? Then they walked out together to Bethany, where he lifted his hands and blessed them. And as he blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. First, let me say that it is easier for us as United Church people to talk about ghosts and haunted houses than it is for most of us to talk about Jesus' resurrection and all the stories of him being taken up into heaven. One minute he is with us and in the blink of an eye he is whooshed into another dimension. But the stories themselves were and are very sacred ones. So what are we going to do with them? Padre Gautama from Cornila community says of trying to pay attention to our biblical stories. If we're going to take them seriously, then we have to spend time with them and engage with them. He writes, by paying attention to the nooks and crannies where the imagination can lodge, sometimes a new story emerges. The story changes, we change, and we find our way into an old story. This is a work of theology, it's a work of intelligence, and it's a work of prayer. I like that. It's not easy, but I like it. David Eward is a retired United Church minister from BC and the creator of the Holy Textures blog. And he says of this task that we have as Christians of reading the stories, the scriptures, and trying to understand what those ancient words are saying to us. He says this, in 
my own experience of living with the scriptures, I have come to find great power in the notion that we might read a scripture story in the way Joseph Campbell taught us to approach myths, namely that it is something true that may have actually happened. As a preacher and a person of faith, my own appreciation for the scriptures has grown as I've come to understand the scriptures in this way. Gone is the tension of reconciling supernatural accounts with my own rationality. Gone is the sense that the Bible must be a primitive text that is simply uninformed by modern scientific understanding. Instead, the Bible and particular accounts such as this one that speaks of something quite startling and strange becomes richer and more meaningful. Then they walked out together to Bethany, where he lifted his hands and blessed them. And as he blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. You see, Jesus was their everything. He was going to set them free from Rome. And now he was dead, killed because he challenged empire, because he walked willingly into death, and they were not brave enough to follow him. For three days, they were lost in grief. For three days, they were essentially orphans. For three days, they didn't know what to do with themselves. They didn't know what to think. But then on the third day, he rose again. And he took them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. What were they supposed to do now? Now that Jesus has withdrawn and let himself be carried away. I wonder, I wonder, what were they supposed to do? Or what about us? When we lose our way, when we can no longer work, when someone we loved has died, when it's hard to get up in the morning, when we feel as if God has abandoned us, what are we supposed to do? How are we to live? David Ewart basically says of this story, the one that is our scripture lesson today. You know when Jesus said, do you remember what I taught you when we were together? Well, friends, it's now over to you. The message of new life and forgiveness, it's over to you. Over to you. Proclaim these things. Don't merely teach them. Declare them. Announce them. Make them actual. It's over to you. Get ready to stand up and speak the truth and nothing but the truth over to you. And in his final act, Jesus blesses them. Then they walked out together to Bethany where he lifted his hands and blessed them. And as he blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Might it not be that even in heaven, Jesus now resurrected is still blessing his disciples and saying it's over to you. It's over to us. Richard Rohr's blog this past Thursday, there is this story. He wrote about church historian Diana Butler Bass, who shares a moment she experienced while at prayer before the icon of Jesus in the Washington National Cathedral. Get me out of here, a voice said again. I stared at the icon. Jesus, is that you? Get me out of here, I heard again, more insistent now. But Lord, the chapel fell silent. But I know I heard a divine demand for freedom. In 2021, she wrote this about the impact that the pandemic has had on our building bound Christianity. As millions have discovered in these many months, Jesus was not confined to a building. Jesus was around our tables at home, with us on walks and hikes, present in music, art, and books, and visible in faces via Zoom. Jesus was with us when we felt we could do no more, overwhelmed by work and online school. 
Jesus was with us as we prayed with the sick in the hospital over cell phones. Jesus did not leave us to suffer alone. COVID-19 forced Jesus out of the cathedral into the world, reminding Christians that church is not a building. Rather, church is wherever two or three are gathered, even if the two is only you and your cat. And where Jesus is present in bread that regular people bake, bless, and break at family tables and homemade altars. I did not liberate Jesus from the cathedral. A pandemic did. Jesus is with us here. So what does that mean for us on the 29th of May? What does it mean that Jesus is here? The risen Christ blessing us, encouraging us, beckoning us out of our buildings and into our neighborhoods and world. Andrew King writes this poem called Beginning at Jerusalem about this scripture from Luke. Begin in the brightly painted kitchens, at the table set for supper and on the wide couches where we watch TV. Begin while we are sorting the laundry, writing out the shopping list and in front of our bathroom mirrors. Begin in the barns, among the warmth of animals and the smells of grain and manure. Begin in the growing fields and in the flooded pastures and where the rains have not come and the soil is cracked and hard. Begin in the gleaming office towers, the shiny shopping malls, the sweaty factory floors. Begin on crumbling sidewalks and amid the rumble of subways, at machines, at our desks, by the coffee makers and computers. Begin with the rich, the comfortable, begin with the poor, the desperate, among the successful, the self-assured, among the failed, the floundering, in the glitter of the halls of power and in the cold and shadowed corners of tragedy and defeat. Begin on a day when the sun is brilliant, on a day when the sky is gray, in a time when economies are favorable, in a time when all is rust, at the moment when leaders are caring or amid indifference, hostility, despair. Let us begin beginning again. And whether we have begun, begun and triumphed or begun and struggled and faltered, we will continue our beginning as we have from our beginning at Jerusalem, which is wherever and whoever we are, which begins wherever and whoever we are. I think that for me is part of the truth of this story. That in Jesus leaving, he bequeathed to his followers the ability and the task of beginning again to tell the gospel truth to be about peace, to understand our part in our history and in our time. Jesus is the heart that broke for all the brokenhearted in all times and in all places. I quoted Nora Gallagher at the beginning of the service and I want to end with her from her book, Things Seen and Unseen, A Year Lived in Faith. She writes, belief and disbelief in the resurrection trade places in my heart like watchmen taking shifts. I've known for years that even those words, belief and disbelief, don't really describe what I think when I think about the resurrection. Something happened to him is the way I put it to myself. Something happens to me. She says that in the mid 80s, she visited a dinosaur dig with, Vince, with Vincent's aunt Melinda, her children and a friend. And the dig was in Eastern Montana on the edge of the prairie that had once been an inland sea. 
She says we slept in huge white teepees, getting up in the night to watch the northern lights sprinkle the sky with pink powder. During the day, we fished for pieces of dinosaur egg in the clay soil with toothbrushes and dentists' fine pointed tools. The largest egg fragment she says that she found was a quarter inch wide, coal black, and finely pitted like the rind of an orange. It was a hundred million years old. And all around us were pieces of egg and bone, fragments, and nothing made sense. Each evening, a paleontologist described what they had made of these bits and pieces, how they saw mother dinosaurs on nests, dinosaurs that lived in herds, their duck bills, their webbed feet. Listening to him was like watching a weaver make whole cloth out of threads or a pot emerge from shards. She says, when I ponder the resurrected Jesus, what I see is this coherence, this possibility. Out of the chaos and trauma of death, something new is written or, reve or revealed. Jesus walked through the curtain into the reality blazing behind it, a place he had grasped and apprehended all his life. Then because he lived fully in hope, fully in love, something happened to him. Nothing kept him, nothing held on to him. The past didn't weigh him down. He returned more coherent, more real, carrying reality with him in a final act of love. Jesus, as archaeologists, picked up the pieces, made them cohere, gave them meaning, knitted finally everything together. In the resurrection, nothing is hopeless anymore. Nothing is ever hopeless anymore. Amen. This morning's virtual musical offering features Rafe Von Williams' antiphon from his five mystical songs, sung by Fairland Avenue Senior Choir Bass Section Lead, Giles Tompkins, and accompanied on the piano by his wife, Kate Tremels. Let's listen to this gift of music. Oh, 
Let us pray. It's been a week. We keep thinking, you and I, that things will lighten up a bit, that good news will be our delight. And of course that happens, good news that is. But the troubling reality of our world seems unrelenting these days. Sudden storms and falling trees, Ukraine and Russia in a war that does not end, refugees fleeing unimaginable conditions, and 22 dead in Texas, 19 children and two teachers, and an 18-year-old boy in a country that will sell him assault weapons as a birthday right, and more graves of children on residential school land. And so we pray, loving God, for wisdom and courage and fortitude, we pray for the eyes and heart to see the goodness that is, take in the joy that still can be felt, and have the spirit to bear hope to one another. In the following moments of silence, we bring to you the prayers on our hearts, the fears that keep us awake, the love of the other that still emboldens, and the hope that crosses all divisions, the hope of the living God and of the resurrection resurrection of the spirit and of truth and of reconciliation. We long to find a place to relax, O oh God, to lean into the welcome and love of real friends who stay true no matter who we are or what we've done. We want to be known, not just our names, but ourselves, our dreams and longings, our fears and failings, and be warmly, unrestrainedly welcomed. And you have created a place like this for us, a place of people with failings and disagreements who still look out for one another, a place of difference and struggle where we can all belong, a place of faith and deep doubt, a place of awkward stumbling toward Christ-likeness, a place of worship, of mystery, and of rest. And though we can't always see it, although sometimes it doesn't feel like it, this is the place here not the buildings and the furniture. No, these people who gather each week in your name by Zoom or in person and try so hard to remember each other's names and faces. For this place and your being with us, we give our heartfelt gratitude and devotion. And so this morning from this place of welcome and safety, we pray for our world where hatred and fear can be very real, where welcome is not extended and safety not always given. Holy One, known by many names, where the voiceless and the powerless are ignored or exploited by the powerful and the connected, we pray for a new vision of power. 
where the weak and the vulnerable are taken advantage of by the strong and the violent, we pray for a new vision of power. Where the uncertain and the seeking are judged by the religious and the sure, we pray for a new vision of power. Wherever power is used as a weapon, protected as a limited resource, or employed for self-aggrandizement, we pray, O oh God, for a new vision of power and for the courage to share it wherever we may. Amen and amen. Greetings. Our weekly online newsletter comes out every Thursday. Here are some highlights. The re-entry task group has an update. As of today, Sunday, May the 29th, we now offer two choices for seating in the sanctuary, unrestricted and socially distanced. If you want to sit close to your friends and neighbors, you can do just that in the designated rows in the unrestricted sections. If you prefer to remain socially distanced while in the sanctuary, you can still do so. We have set up distinct areas in the sanctuary for each group. You will no longer need to pre-register for in-person services. As always, we request that you wear well-fitting masks while inside the building. The next two Sundays are very exciting for our Fairlawn community. June the 5th is our Affirm Sunday, both in person and online. Please join us for the celebration of Pride Month with selections from your favorite musicals, readings, and guest speakers. We start with an outdoor celebration with sidewalk chalk and music. June the 12th is our Diversity and Allyship service, highlighting the vital role of allyship in our community and congregation. Our guest preacher is Sherry DeNovo, author of The Queer Evangelist. And this afternoon, you are invited to join us for coffee chat on Zoom at 1.15. And now my friends, this blessing. May you walk with God in the sharp pain of growing, in the midst of confusion, in the bright light of knowing. May you live in God, in God's constant compassion, in God's infinite wisdom, in God's passion for peace. May you walk with God and live in God and remain with God this day and forever. Amen. Friends, how good and pleasant it is to be together, encouraging and consoling, provoking and inspiring. But now the service is ended, and now the wider service begins. So go in peace. Go into the world for the love of the world. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>